Hi there, uh, I'm Garth Ennis, and I'm here on Forbidden Planet TV to talk about Battle Action and uh, Rogue Trooper currently running in 2000 AD. Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV, I'm Andrew Sumner. I have a returning guest, one of our frequent returning guests, the one and only Garth Ennis right here. How are you, mate? Hey, Andrew, I'm good. How about you? I'm very well, thanks, brother. I'm very well indeed. Yeah, um, I'm feeling uh, feeling much more compass mentis than the uh, the last time we met up on the South Bank in London. So, you know, I'm a bit more happen, chipper than yeah. the last time we were chatting. Good, good. Yeah. yeah, because that's what this requires, sobriety and solemn seriousness. Absolutely yeah. right. It is, after all, comic books. Let's right. let's let us not forget. <laughs> yeah. So, so, mate, you, 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 well, you're here today to talk about two projects that, as you know, are very close to my heart. Um, uh, uh, both both from a similar publishing stable, our mighty friends at, uh, at Rebellion. But um, why don't we talk about what you're doing with Rogue Trooper first? Because mm. um, because uh, that 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 is a great series. It's a lot of fun, and you must be very pleased with the way it's turned out and with the reaction to it. Yeah, it seems to have gone over well. Um, I think at this point, um, we're just over halfway. I think we're up to eight out of 13 in the latest prog. Um, yes, it's, it seems to have gone over well. Uh, I really enjoyed writing it. And I must say that Paddy Goddard's doing some of the nicest work of his career. I think he's doing a, an absolutely brilliant job on it. Um, couldn't ask for better. Yeah. When, when, were you, uh, when did you first encounter Rogue Trooper? Was it right at the beginning? Yeah. Yeah, I, when he first showed up in, in 2000 AD in, I think, late 81, yeah. it would have been with, you know, with Dave Gibbons and Colin Wilson stuff. Yeah. And then I really just followed him right the way through the rest of the run. You know, all that great Tom Kennedy, Brett Ewins uh, material. Um, I mean, later on, Rogue, I think, goes off the boil. I remember they tried to relaunch it. I really enjoyed that Dave Gibbons, Will Simpson one yeah, uh, with Friday, but um, unfortunately they didn't stick around and they hand, it, it was then handed over to um, to Mike Fleischer, I think. And now, not long after that, I began to lose touch with 2000 AD, but I, I think they then tried some sort of continuity fixing exercise. Um, I think it was Steve White who went manfully into the breach on that one but it, it, it our was, mutual friend uncle steve our mutual white and uncle steve yeah <laughs> but i think it was it was too much to ask of anyone really to fix that mess and that's really as far as i went with rogue i know 2000 have um put out various series and and one-offs with them since i think they even had jerry finley day back for an episode um but as far as i know the character had lain fairly fallow uh, in the years running up to to the one I've got going at the moment, yeah. So so without uh, giving it all away for those who haven't jumped onto it yet or who are waiting for it to be collected, which no doubt will happen. Mm. What can you what can you tell me about your approach and where Rogue is in in this series? Yeah, um, I, yeah. I think there there'll be a collection next summer. Yeah, right. On. Um, so about a year from now, um, I. I wanted to say something, I suppose, about without sounding too highfalutin, the the universal nature of war. Maybe actually a better way of putting it is the endlessness of war. Um, and so what I did was I took Rogue out of his usual setting on New Earth and um, put him in another uh, more familiar 20th century conflict, uh, somewhere where he could perhaps see the roots of um, uh, of the conflict that... Um, that he would eventually take part in not not so much in direct historical terms but more in thematic terms um so he and his biochips bagman gunner and helm find themselves on a an early 20th century battlefield uh where they meet some of the local inhabitants and uh they they're making their way through this unfamiliar yet oddly familiar landscape um they're seeing a lot they know and a lot they don't know uh, they're making new friends disposing of a lot of new enemies and then of course and we've just reached this point in the story there's kind of a twist and uh things get flipped so that rogue is on familiar ground but his new friends aren't 
Yeah. And that's roughly roughly where we are. I tried to write this really as close to the old story, the old 1981 to 1984 story as I could. Um, I don't write it exactly the way the writer Jerry Finley Day would do, but I tried to write it so that it would slot into that run fairly painlessly. Yeah. yeah. And how has it felt to you getting involved with it? And, you know, sometimes you can have a mixed experience, right? Because I remember you tell, we chatted once about your experience of writing Dread, which is very dear to you and was something, and, but, and therefore your experience of creating Dread was, was somewhat different. Yeah. Whereas it seems to me like you're having a much better time creating Rogue Trooper. Uh, yeah, I, I just am very interested in how it feels comparing to that excitement you have when you're younger and you become a fan of it to then get the chance to work on it. Yeah, um, I think as far as dread goes, I simply at that point wasn't ready to do the job. And that's why that's why I didn't produce particularly good scripts. But um, what's happened in the meantime is I've accrued something like 30 years of experience that I can now bring to writing Rogue Trooper. Um, so that helps. Um, doing it when you feel the time is right, rather than when it's it's dropped in your lap and you think you've got the opportunity of a lifetime. Um, there's a big difference there. Uh, in terms of the writing the character, yeah, it's been a real treat. I always liked Rogue. You know, I, I think he is one of the the top uh, classic 2000 AD characters as much as Dread and Strontium Dog and Nemesis and Slain. I mean, I'd, I'd put him up there with them. Um, but uh, I have found that he's perhaps, if you go back and read the old stories, he's perhaps not as clearly defined as some of them. He's not as mysterious as Nemesis. He's not as much of a hardliner as Dread. Um, he's not driven like Johnny Alpha. He's he's a sort of an odd bird in a way because he is supposed to be this genetically engineered soldier, a man bred for war who who will know and do nothing else. And yet, of course, the character was always incredibly human uh, and conscientious. Um, as if he was, you know, as if the idea of, of him being a rogue trooper simply went beyond the idea of him having deserted. He he was actually, in a way, without perhaps necessarily meaning to, rebelling against his creators by being a very human person. Yeah. Even though all he was supposed to be was a kind of walking killing machine. Yeah. So, and in that sense, he, he is perhaps a little less defined than some of those characters. And that, in an odd way, makes him easier to write because you're not as hidebound. Um, with Dread, for instance, uh, much as I love the character, he he has uh, he has a sort of uh, limited series of reactions. He can only yeah. do so much. He will only go so far in any given direction um, unless it's extreme violence, in which case he'll go all the way. But, what I, but in all seriousness, Dread's reactions will be one of a limited number in any given situation rogue i think you have a bit more leeway i think i think that's very interesting and and, and very well said once you once you get to the end of this particular story arc do you see yourself um doing more rogue in the future i might i've got half an idea um and you know this one began they all began as sort of just a few notions a few threads this one began at one point as half an idea what if rogue went to um and writing this story i've, I've really enjoyed writing the bio chips yeah you know th th that are locked into his helmet and his rifle yeah. and his backpack um helm and gunner and bagman the interplay between them is very interesting uh, and a lot of fun to write too. I mean, they are in their own way, uh, very obviously less human than Rogue because they're they're dead men whose personalities are encoded on electronic chips. But not just in that sense; they are also simply because they have a lot more writing on what Rogue's doing. They their quest for vengeance for their own deaths perhaps drives them a bit harder than it does Rogue in, in his search for the traitor general. And so when he's 
he's sidelined by his desire to help people and save people. Um, it pisses Bagman, Gunner, and Helm off quite a bit because they're thinking, no, this isn't why we're here. You're supposed to be finding the guy who who murdered us. Yeah. Uh, and I find that interesting. And, and that's where I am with what I called half an idea for another Rogue series, something to do with the biochips, something that goes into more their experience this time. So watch this space, you know, yeah. if... Um, if it if it does come to anything, um, of course, Matt Smith at 2000 AD will be the first to hear. Yeah. yeah, and quite rightly so. I hope you get the chance to do it, mate. I hope you get the chance to flesh it out. I'd, just from the description, now now we're in one of those like uh, hand selling carbonite moments where it's like, come on, man, <laughs> you just got to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if I got uh, if I got Paddy Goddard again, yeah. um, I mean uh, that would be a huge help. And that would get me a lot, a lot of the way down the road because working with him has been a treat. He's, uh, he's just my ideal kind of artist. Great storytelling, great action, great characters, um, yeah. a great sense of character. Um, so yeah, g- give me Patty again, and there's a good chance it'll happen. Oh, brilliant, mate! Ah, that's that's music to my ears. And and sticking with sticking with this kind of narrative endeavor, um you're about to release your second crack at your kind of curated uh, battle action series. So Mm -hmm. for those who came in late, uh, one of the great things that Garth did last year was revive battle action in this beautiful format, a one shot, which you very kindly came uh, and signed for us at Forbidden Planet. Uh, You did a a great signing with our mates at Gosh also in London. And um, and, uh, it was, uh, it's just a beautiful package they put together, I thought. You know, they really that, did. It was um, really nice. It, it really was. I mean, I, I was surprised in a way because when I pitched it to them, I thought it would be something in the sort of square bound magazine format that the battle special had yeah. been in 2020. Yeah. Um, but they really pulled out all the stops and ter- turned it into this beautiful hardcover, um, which I'm sure uh, probably a bit of a gamble for them, but I am sure it uh, contributed to its success. Which of course contributed to uh, us being allowed to do a second one. Yeah, no, it, I mean I was as, <clears throat> and we talked about this a lot of the, at the time as as an old school fan who loves it. It, it the 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 it, it what you did with it and the package it was delivered in just exceeded my expectations because that I mean it was one thing I I was totally. I knew that you were going to knock it out of the park with the stories and I knew who you were creating the stories with. So I knew that was all in great hands, but to see them actually match it in terms of the quality of what you have in the hands and the, mm. the time warp notion of it being in that kind of annual format. I love that. Yeah. Mate. yeah, it did. It did work out well. I mean, we, we agreed from the start myself and Keith Richardson and um, uh, Oliver Pickles at rebellion. We, we agreed that it should definitely echo that famous, battle cover line that you see again and again seven great stories inside so we want we wanted that you know we wanted that on the cover we wanted that on the imagery we wanted to promote it that way um so it was um it was some it was something that i think uh triggered something in old battle and action readers in a very positive way it was like oh yes we know what we're getting here yeah no, well said. So, what have they? Uh, so, what what can we expect of of your next round? Okay, so this time it's actually going to be a five issue mini series, um, and each issue will have two stories, one by me and one by another writer. Um, so I'm coming back with um, some of the same characters I wrote last time, uh, Johnny Red again. Yeah. And Crazy Keller and Dredger and yeah. Hellman, and I've got the same the same artists on those. And I've also revived an old strip called Cooley's Gun, which was a Jerry Finley Day, um, uh, Jeff Campion strip. Quite a quite a short one. It only lasted about six months, but I have a I have quite a fond memory of it because it's uh, it's about this very nasty piece of work, Lance Corporal Cooley, who's a a particularly vicious Vickers machine gunner um, who I don't think he cracks a smile once in the whole thing, but he certainly seems to enjoy mowing down the enemy. And uh, it's, it's the story of Cooley and his, his gun 
and his long suffering loader, this little bloke, this little rookie who's just shown up called Jimmy Miller. Um, that really, it really stayed with me down the years. And so I've, I've revived that and I've got uh, Staz Johnson oh, on brilliant. the yard for that. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize just how much of a sort of a World War II hardware aficionado Staz is, but he really knows his stuff and he's really brought this to life in a, in a wonderful way. Um, and then I mentioned uh, there's going to be other writers. So the the other ones, just to, if I can remember this, uh, you've got um, you've got Rob Williams writing Death Squad with PJ Holden. Oh, uh, great! That's that's a, that's a great combo. It is. And then you've got uh, he's doing Major Easy with Henry Flint. Yeah. Um, you've got Dan that's Abnett great. and Phil Winslade on D Day Dawson. Um, Torin Grunbeck is taking over writing. Uh, Nina Petrova and the Angels of Death. Yeah. Um, that's with Paddy Goddard again. And I'm delighted to say that in the first issue, alongside my Johnny Red strip, will be John Wagner's first HMS Nightshade story oh, since, since 1979 when the story ended its original run. And uh, Dan Cornwell is drawing that. So um, it's oh, a, that's a massive treat, mate. That is brilliant. Yeah. It's a pretty good lineup. I, having John involved, though, you know, as one of the the original duo who along with with pat mills uh created battle in the first place uh yeah that really is something special yeah i mean that's that's a wonderful lineup and you know it's certainly ticking the boxes for an old school fan like me i'm mean, just hearing you talk about coolie's gone that to me that that those storylines are the epitome of what those lads at fleetway and ipc when they're creating that it, the people who worked that's really what they did that was unlike anybody else you know yeah it wasn't coming out of any other group of creators that kind of stuff yeah you're you're quite right uh warlord certainly went some distance yeah. in that direction away from traditional war comics but i think it really took mills and wagner uh to, to go all the way with battle and have a series of characters who were not necessarily unlikable, but who were certainly a lot more formidable yeah. than the kind of nice chaps who had traditionally um, popped up in British war comics. Um, you know, people who perhaps in in Victor and even Valiant and Hotspur and things like that were, were definitely a very idealized notion of um the traditional fighting man you know the honorable soldier in battle you had people who were surviving by the skin of their teeth and who sometimes were only the heroes because the villains were significantly worse than they were <laughs> um Cooley's an interesting example um as i say he is a particularly nasty piece of work and he you could almost see him in another story as a villain as one of these thugs who our hero has to contend with from time to time um instead though jerry finley day puts cooley front and center as as the main protagonist of the strip i think that you know i think that's so interesting because the analogy i would strike because <clears throat> i was a warlord fan as well and, mm -hmm. and used to enjoy it for a variety of reasons i used to quite like union jack jackson you know quite like the warlord itself because of the conceits of it all it's a secret agent strip but to me the difference between the two it's exactly like watching a, a Bud Buttica um, Western with Randolph Scott mm -hmm. and then going, okay, and then watch him for a few dollars more, you know, with Lee Van Cleef. It's that difference, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Yes, it is. It, it's, yeah. um, it's someone seeing the seeds, seeing the possibilities and going, but if we go further, we'll have something really, really special. Like these, these guys, Maybe they were showing us the way, or maybe they were just maybe they hadn't even realized what they had uh, sitting in front of them. But we're going to take all that potential, and yeah. we're going to come up with this. And that again, that's what Pat and John did. Yeah, uh, does that vein of of nastiness, which is I guess even more like Sergio Corbucci than it is Sergio Leone, you know? And it's like there's this venal streak that pops out every now and again, which is what I really savor about their work. Yeah, I I think so. Um, you know, once once you go down that path, it's hard to stop having fun with it. Uh, but you think of um, you think of the lead character of Darkies Mob, or Dredger, or well, a character like Cooley, or some of the nasty pieces of work who would show up occasionally in Johnny Red and Charlie's War. Not necessarily the leads, 
yeah. but definitely a, a big parts of the strip. And you realize like, yes, these these guys are fun. Writing these monsters is a lot of fun. Um, it's something that you see going right through 2000 AD. I, I suppose the most obvious and extreme example of it is, again, Dread. Yeah. Where you have the most unlikely comic strip hero possibly of all time. Yeah. Uh, you know, a guy who's last, who, who certainly stood the test of all those years. Um, but who's all the more remarkable for the fact that he's he is at heart so unlikable, and yet he's he's impossible to stop watching. Yeah, no, it's very true. I tell you another early two thousand AD character that was filled with that kind of venal, unpleasant energy. Not a pleasant character at all. But do you remember the Visible Man? Right. Yeah, it's and he's right. it's, it's just he's fucking horrible in, in, in essence you know what i mean it's not yes. particularly well put together doesn't really have an ending you know no. they don't know where to go with it so it's like literally it's literally yeah. just has a ridiculous ending but um it does it's funny i thought you were going to say bill savage oh yeah well of course i mean bill savage yeah. of course you know but yeah. uh yeah the visible man is just such a ridiculous strip you know and it's like it's one idea yeah. And, and they seem to power it through with the sheer unpleasantness of the of the protagonist. Yeah. Like, until they've got nowhere to go with it. Yes, he's he's actually he's not a very nice guy to begin with, as I recall. He's, and then he horrible. suffers this he suffers this catastrophic accident and he he comes up against people far worse than he could ever <laughs> be, you know, which I suppose is a is would be a, a real um a, a, a very typical Pat Mills trope where yes, there are people who you know, fed by their own ego and selfishness can be can be pretty unpleasant types. But it's uh, it, it's those who wield the power of the establishment yeah. that are a million times worse. Yeah, no, that that's true. I mean, I think an interesting thing that happens with uh, 2000 AD is the nominal lead strip to begin with, and kind of like the you know the nominal scent is is very very old school, right? It's a Mac one. It's very old school, and it, and his hmm. first. You know, in his first narrative sequence, Mac one is essentially Steve Austin. He's not mm -hmm. even Dredger. He's much more of a bland, like leading man. Yeah. But when it takes that hiatus and then comes back, and they find, you know, they find Hip Pro has gone off the grid and he's lying in his in a wallowing in his own yeah. drunken When it yeah. comes back, then it's a pure 2000 AD strip. After that. Yes. So Anti-establishment with him getting fucked over by his bosses and all that kind of stuff. That's right. It's it's like I remember that that issue actually because I think he um I think he's got just enough hyper power left to fight off the guys who've been sent to get him and he picks up the entire bar like he rips it out of the floor yeah. and <laughs> flings it across the uh, the interior of the pub. But but yes, at that point, even though even though he's a very formidable character, Mach One is is almost a victim himself, and he's Absolutely. a victim of these establishment figures who will ultimately prove his undoing. Yeah, and yeah. dies a victim. Yeah, absolutely yeah. right. And it's a, just a completely different deal. It's like they, they, they clearly become um, very confident of their approach by then. And they must have, yeah. I, I'd always looked at it as I got older, that Mac one must have been the thing that he turned around to John Sanders and gone, well, look, look we've got this. It's a $6 million man, right? And they yeah. built everything else around it. And at the point where it's like, well, actually, everything else is the book and it works. And we're yes. getting away with it then it's like they just brought it into the vision yeah yeah it's it's interesting when you consider that you know if 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 you realize that the formula they hit upon was the boss is a bad guy you know the boss your boss my boss anybody's boss is is far worse in terms of what he can do and what he means to your life and the effect he can have on you than some guy who's going to try and mug you on the way home yeah yeah um you that, know, and you see, you see them build on that and use that again and again. Yeah, I mean, it would not surprise me at all knowing some of these characters that, you know, what you've just hit upon is one brilliant extended metaphor, you know, for working for working at Fleetway in the uh, in the late 70s. Very yeah. possibly. I think a lot of it also comes from um, Pat and uh, Kev O'Neill as well of being beaten to a pulp by monks and nuns during their religious yes. upbringing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean that'll that'll teach you all the wrong lessons about already <laughs> right there, yeah. Hey, it's so it's so true, mate. I could uh, I could plow this uh, delicious furrow for a lot longer. So uh, <laughs> I'll just segue into one final World War Two comics related thing because it, it dropped into my mind when we were talking. 
I was trying to think. Oh, okay, what, what was what was what was the strip that I really did think was trying to be something else in Warlord? And the one that, that kind of stuck in my mind and I, I remember being memorable to me was: Did you ever read A Case of Death? Mm, no, I don't know that one. So basically, um, a kind of bomber pilot is like shot down uh, over over um, over France. He's on a bombing mission to to blow up a like particular uh, Gestapo building in um, in Berlin, right? Mm -hmm. And he crashes, and all his his crew die. I mean, I, oh, this is pure memory, so I might have some of the details wrong. But he finds that the working of the bomb is completely intact. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what he does is he takes essentially the explosives and the timer and loads it into a kind of like a French peasant's battered old suitcase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And decides he's going to hike into the center of Berlin and, uh, and, 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 and blow up his objective on foot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the series then in that kind of classic fugitive style is what happens to him on his journey until he oh, gets right. to his objective. Now that sounds when I describe it, it sounds like a battle story, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it initially it sounds sort of absurd because you can imagine you know like this week he loses his bomb can, <laughs> yeah. he, can he get his bomb back and yeah. complete his mission but yeah but there's something sort of grimly driven about a character yeah. like that. You could you could sort of see him in battle li later on yeah i i do remember from warlord i remember more the uh the german strips like yeah. camp Group falcon yeah. and Iron Annie, because i think they were both drawn initially by mike dory um you know who i've who i've got drawn hellman yeah. um and uh, he was particularly good at that stuff not just the hardware he really just caught something in the characters i think um as he continues to do yeah i wonder i mean i wonder if he's sitting in a house full of like sven hassel novels and whatnot you know to me i wonder why that's it. Possibly. that's the thing that he's drawn to you know it's uh possibly um i know that uh i know that you know battle had its german strips as well yeah. Um, I think Hellman was based on the the Robert Shaw character in the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah. Um, but certainly, um, and I know also that Jerry Finley Day had a particular interest in um the, the German war machine and and various units. But um the the one that uh, the one that was particularly influenced by Sven Hassel, I think, was Death Squad. Ah, uh, yeah. That's, well, that's well. Alan Alan Hebden and Eric Bradbury. And, you know, because it's the same idea, it's the punishment battalion, yeah. you know, the guys who are so dirty, they're, they're basically, you know, it's, it's either the battlefield or prison, and prison has taken them back to the battlefield, really. Yeah. Yeah. That's very Sven Hassel sort of thing. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Let, let's close out on a question I've got for you, which is, um, hmm. let me get this right. So Major Easy. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is what I've always struggled with, with this character. Is Major Easy English or American? Um, well, that's to me, that's part of the problem with the character in that he is so very obviously James Coburn. <laughs> right. right. Um, he's taken from the American movies of the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, he the he's... anachronism of Kelly's heroes, for example. Exactly, exactly. Um, that's why he never really resonated with me and I was never a particularly big fan. Um, great looking character, but, uh, and while there were certainly some, some oddballs in the early SAS and the, the long range desert group, which preceded them, I, I think easy is a step too far because he's so obviously a creation of seventies American movies. Yeah. Um, it's why actually I'm a much bigger fan of crazy Keller. Yeah. Uh, who's a similar, you know, roguish outsider with his own agenda. I just think he works so much better because he's American to begin with. And somehow that kind of maverick fits an American character better to me. But that's OK, because, I, you know, I'm going to continue to write Crazy Keller. And if Rob wants to do Major Easy, I'm aware the character's uh, popular. You know, to me, there's that, that's the perfect solution. You get you get both. And uh, there are enough easy fans out there that they'll respond to that, I think. Yeah, well, and well said, mate. And I'm one of them. I love Major Easy. It, just because of the card, just because of the, all the James Coburn of it all. But it is, as a concept, fucking preposterous. You know what yes. I mean? It's just, there's no way he could exist. He just couldn't exist within the 
British military infrastructure of the time. That's it's nonsense. Do you know? What yeah, I, mean? I think um, I think actually Alan Hebden, who who created him with Carla, said something about him possibly being uh, Irish Maltese, something <laughs> like that. Uh, you know, what one of these one of these guys who you know from from the the vast vast and varied diaspora of the the British Empire finds their way back into the British fighting forces in time for World War II and who's an obvious candidate for special forces yeah. um I think he does start out with the LRDG actually so you know that's that's from the guy who created him that's as good an explanation as as is required I think yeah right on mate so i think that's a good place to 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 close out mate and, and emphasize the fact that this glorious second take on battle action the battle action mini series is uh, going to be coming out in the very next in the, in the very near future the next week or two everybody watching this conversation can pre-order it from the links attached to our conversation and uh, thanks for joining me mate I, I love the last edition of this as you know as i've already said and i can't wait to get this in my hands and read it yeah everyone's given everything they've got uh just like first time around and uh fingers crossed it goes well this time we'll get a third um 2025 will be the 50th anniversary of battle it would be nice to have something battle related out that year yeah i think we've got to just self-actualize that think about it and make it happen mate you know so so fingers crossed indeed anyway mate as they as they used to say to me at school you're doing god's work keeping the battle universe alive and i for one i'm at the front of a long list of of old british comics readers who loves it do you know what i mean so it, and and it's not just it's not just an entertaining retread it, it you're really honoring the spirit of it and bringing it alive mate it's great stuff Thank you. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's to me, it's a dream come true. And uh, I'll write those characters as long as I can. So cheers. Right on, brother. You take care of yourself, Garth, and I'll see you very soon. All right. Cheers, cheers Andrew. See ya. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.